Hello there. Welcome to the Geek and the Guru Series 66 podcast, episode two. Oh boy, here we go again. I love it, Dean. Uh, with me, of course, Dean Tinney, the Series 7 Guru. Uh, my name is Brian Lee. I'm the test geek, of course. Um, and we want to look at the investment vehicle section for the Series 66 today. Uh, 17 questions. Not too bad, but I, I want to caution folks, Dean, about this because I often see if people don't make the grade on the Series 66, it is often because of the investment vehicles of all things. There's only 17 questions. And by God, by Joe, by Cracky, you just passed the Series 7. Why would it be a difficult area? on the Series 66. That's well, what we want to bring to you today mm -hmm. is some of those areas. Dean, your thoughts? Yeah, I was just going to say, too, I, you know, you got to respect the 66. So I think sometimes there's two things. I think, uh, and we'll be talking about it, Brian, the, the first is that uh, I think that this hubris, lack of respect for the 66, <laughs> I got a little bit of feeling uh, full of myself passing the 7. You should. You should feel really good about making your mark on that 7. And then I think the second part is, they look at the book, they look at it, it kind of looks familiar. And then they say, oh, I know this stuff. This is the seven over again. Uh, no, it is not the seven over again. And uh, Brian, I think we were talking that what we want to do is point out some of those areas that are a little different from the seven, tested a little different, things you may not have encountered on your, your Series 7. That's, that's exactly right. And I believe we touched upon this quite a bit in, in uh, episode one about, you know, the hubris and, and taking your foot off the gas for the Series 66. Right. So we come to you again to remind <laughs> you, don't take your foot off the gas for the 66. Yeah. Uh, again, and I think I mentioned this in the first episode, I just, you know, the pass rate for the 66 is slightly less than the seven. I'm not just trying to scare you here. Just want to make sure that you have be as diligent with this puppy as you were with the Series 7. You yeah. just passed that thing. Great job, right? We want to get you the old P on That's this right. one. 3-0, and o, not 2-1. 3-2-1 yeah, one one is very exactly. depressing. So let's take a look at some areas uh, on the investment vehicles. Again, 17 questions. Uh, obviously, you know, I don't know why, Dean, I hear you say this quite often, that a lot of these exams, the FINRA exam, the NASA exam, think we're going to be bond traders. Why is there so many bond questions <laughs> on these exams, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, my goodness. I think there's truth in labeling. I always joke on the seven, you know, they, they you know, for years, we people have referred uh, to the Series 7 as the stockbroker's exam. And I've always said it should be referred to the bond broker's exam because there's way more questions on bonds. And in and the same thing on uh, on... 66. I don't know if I would say there's more bond questions. I think there is. But I also think that um, uh, it's not the equity securities usually that people struggle with. Uh, you know, That's right. it's the bond stuff That's right. more than the equity stuff. So I, I, I'm assuming that everyone remembers their teeter-totter, you know, the bond price, the bond yield relationship, uh, the current yield calculations, and that uh, YMCA, YMCA was the acronym that I like to give in class for current yield, right? Yield to maturity, yield to call. Yes, yeah. yield to call is out on the end there. Right. Um, so all of that's pretty much the same. The interest rate risk, maturity is longer term versus shorter term. But one risk that uh, you'll probably see on the 66 that isn't discussed much, if at all, on the 7 is duration. And if you don't mind me saying, duration has nothing to do with maturity. <laughs> yeah. Um, That's the comment. I'll let you comment on that. I, I, the way I say it, Brian, is I've had some serious bond geeks, uh, pun intended, uh, Mr. Test Geek. Uh, <laughs> but they say, Dean, I don't like that teeter-totter or seesaw that uh, everybody uses. I go, why? And they say, well, you know, it, it really isn't accurate. Bonds don't really have a linear relationship no, like that. Right. I go... Well, true, but I like it because it turns judgment questions into aim and shoot point and click questions. Exactly. And, you know, the what I think is duration kind of reflects that that's not a linear relationship. You may be where you're going with maturity, you know, that, you know, right. geeky term convexity, the yeah. idea that it yeah. isn't a linear that's relationship. Right. I know that's where you're going with the maturity, Brian, but yeah. that's why I usually tell people I still think that for the most part, 
what they've learned in seven can answer questions about duration. Really? Yeah. What do you think? Ed? Um, well, what I generally do, and again, turning mashed potatoes into premium vodka, right? <laughs> yeah. I And I even get a little heat from the outside world and social mm. media because of the way I, I address something. Because again, I'm not, I'm not concerned. My ego is not big enough to worry about educating people. I just want to get people past an exam. Right. That's all I care about. So what I generally tell people about duration, you know, though I I'll always ask, what's a general definition? Five words for duration, right? And they start with the word maturity every single time. I go, and stop. It's coupon rate. Huh? It's coupon rate. Because what if you get a question with four bonds as answers and they all have the same maturity? Which one's going to be more volatile? Well, you're not going to be looking at maturity dates because they're all the same. It's the coupon rates. The lower the coupon rate is the most volatile when the maturities are the same. Mm -hmm. So that's what I want test takers to focus on is the coupon rate. You know, but, I do go into the basic definition and how all right. that works. Yeah. The amount of years it takes for the interest to repay principal. Yeah, I stuff. just say I just say long and low. So long and low. I if hear the, that. The, matur yes. if the maturity is the same, then it's the oh the coupon. But I'll add to that. I agree with you, Brian, because that's what the coupon does, right? It acts as a stabilizer on the price. Gotcha. The higher the coupon, the more likely somebody's going to step in and buy the bond to collect that higher semi-annual payment. Right. Then somebody's going to step in. So in general. Uh, all investments that have income streams are more stable than investments that do not. Right. And investments that have higher uh, income streams are more stable than investors not. I use the zero as the the exact opposite of that, right? If it's a zero coupon bond, well, then there's no stabilizer. Right? That's right. That's right. And and that's where it, uh, the duration leads to right. is the zero coupon bond, which we did learn in Series 7 is almost <laughs> always the most volatile. Right. Well, you know, again, on the test, you might see one question on it. It might be a basic definition. It's a measure of bond volatility. What do you think, Brian, about longer duration versus shorter duration and longer duration meaning more volatile? You think I don't think that? it gets into that okay. kind of depth. Okay. I really I don't. Like I said, I do give some background to it, yeah. right? Because I do like to give a little context right. to right. a concept, but not too much because... Anything that goes in that way is going to be coming out that way, yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah. I try to so much, it so much only so much space exactly. in the brain housing group. That's exactly, right. That's exactly right. Another concept you know that comes up on the sixty six are the Treasury Inflation Protection Securities. <laughs> it's funny. I used to say, "Why would anybody want to buy these things?" Because we haven't had inflation in twenty years, right? Mm -hmm. Until the last eighteen months. Again, what's the most important thing to know? For answering test questions on tips, it's the principal, not the coupon. Okay? Uh, because you have to make these semi-annual adjustments based on the CPI, the Consumer Price Index, which adjusts the principal amount, not the coupon rate. That's the one thing you have to remember. The coupon's fixed. That's not yeah. ever going to change. Yeah, it's the principal I value the government's giving you back, and it's done semi-annually, I would point out. And I don't think a lot of times uh, test prep vendors uh, get into a higher complicated mouth about whether how it compounds. But, you know, I would just tell you that as a Actually. test taker, you don't have to do the compounding. You could just if CPI is 8 percent, 8 percent of the par is $80 right. twice. And because of compounding, it'd be something north of that. So you can kind of just do simple math. Go above that. I, I, I recall a question I was given about uh an investor has a tip. Uh, it's a CPI at three uh, percent. What is the correct coupon rate? Oh, there you go. There it was a four percent tip. Well, so you know, that even after the adjustment, guess what the coupon rate is? Yeah, it's still four yeah. percent. I love that. I love that because that makes it turns it into an aim and shoot point and click question. Exactly. Instead of uh, you know judgment question. Because we know the sixty six is not calculations. One one uh, calculator. I just question. finished the tutoring session today, Brian, and. It just, it's aggravating because, it well, I, you know, it's well, aggravating because we know that the know. test takers do not. I know. And so exactly. sometimes they, they lose focus and they start to do too much on the quantitative side. I know, Brian, are you ever tempted to tell them that, you know, that 
just guess B on these because you're you know you could devote your I don't, your, I don't. your prior study period to you know quantity of analysis and it's only like three points. You're better served doing other things. So, anyways, well, I still I, did it. We I, went over that stuff, but that's right. I always tell the story. Remember from the series sixty five. Yeah. You know, they, I, I get emails all the time. Can you send me a list of formulas? And I say no. I'm not going to send you a list of formulas if you don't know their context around them, where they belong. As I go through my content, I'll show you where, if there is a formula, whether, if you have to calculate it or just regurgitate a point and shoot question, as you said. So uh, I I don't. Sometimes, you know, uh, on the current yield questions in Series 65, sometimes 66 as well. When I say uh, it's a 6% bond, it's trading at 920, right? I yeah. give them four answer choices for the current yield. Right. And of course, only one of them is above the coupon rate, which yeah. is the correct, the correct answer, right. right? I said, okay, please find the current yield. And then I see all these people in the class, <laughs> right? I go, stop, throw that darn calculator away. You don't need it. They don't test your math skills. Yeah. Concepts. I, I even add to that, Brian. I say, if you think it's a math question, just read it once again, just to make sure it really is, because it could right. be a question like that where it right. looks like a math question. But it's more of a relationship question. Than I found some of these folks are just so intimidated by math. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot. And the, other thing, the other thing I would uh, just make a note on the tips is doesn't beat inflation keeps pace. If you've got to be carefully if you're trying to outperform inflation, common stocks over the long term. So that's right. Just that's make sure that the answer is set. That's right. So tips again, like I said, is is uh, one area on the 66 you might see. And you might yeah. see one question on yeah. it. I don't think there's much more than that that you haven't seen on the seven. Okay. Yeah. Uh, equity securities. Uh, not a whole lot new that I know of, except for the analysis, the valuation factors. That go into, because remember, and we mentioned this, I believe, in, in, in the first episode, a very important role of, of investment advisor firms, if not their reps themselves, are constructing structured portfolios, right? 70, 30, 80, 20, 60, 40. And you got to decide what investments to put into that portfolio. That means you have to analyze these investments, right? You have to have, do your due diligence to, to choose. So that's another big difference between the 66 and the 7. It's a lot more on the quantitative analysis, the valuation of securities uh, that you don't see on the 7, right? Totally agree. Totally agree. One of the new changes, we mentioned this uh, with the 65 podcast about the June 12th changes, and there is a, a question or two uh, that's been showing up on a very specific type. Why NASA chose these, I don't know. <laughs> it's amazing. Is the SPAC. <laughs> Crazy. What do you think about it? Have you seen some SPACs out there? I, I have. They were, they were a fad. And I think to answer the question, that's why NASA incorporated this. They always are... All the regulars are always behind the curve. Once the fad has passed is when they, I shouldn't say fad because with uh, people who lost a lot of money in a fad. So that's what triggers NASA on this. And, you know, a, a special purpose acquisition corporation or blind pool, they've been around for years and years and years. And the big problem with them is a lack of disclosure, that it's a lot easier to raise money from the public with less disclosure by having a SPAC that goes out and acquires a private company. Right. And so that's why I think they're, they're testing on these. Uh, it's one of those things where, you know, the classical line from, uh, you know, the days is where are the customers yachts, yeah. you know, in terms of right. the brokerage business. And this is usually the promoters that are making uh, the money off these uh, and uh, investors have uh, uh, been taken advantage of according to NASA. So I think that's why it's on there. I think uh, you uh, should be as an investor and as somebody who, if you're selling a SPAC or putting in a portfolio, ooh, yeah. Because remember, it's really based on the ability of the promoter or sponsor to uh, go buy at an attractive basis an acquisition for stock. Right. You know, that will work out. And uh, usually they're willing to overpay because it, the reason they'd overpay, Brian, is if they don't come up with an acquisition, they got to give everybody back their money. That's right. And that's kind of a hard thing to get back people money. So, you know, there, if it's a closing at the last minute, oh, well, gee, you know, uh, 
Dude, That's right. I thought the debrief that you had was I, I've now heard it since. And uh, you always tend to get some good debrief. And uh, I'm like, wow, OK, I've never heard that. In fact, you even asked me that uh, based on that That's question right. debrief. I go, I have no idea. I, I would think it's whatever the uh, market will bear, but uh, exactly. not so. So you want to share that debrief with? On, on absolutely. The of course. Uh, the special purpose acquisition company is a blind pool, often referred to as a blind pool, is basically a shell. They don't do anything other than go out and acquire companies, right? And of course, they acquire that company. They can do all kinds of things, and that's a whole right. different story. But, but they need to raise capital in order to acquire these companies. So what they do is offer shares to the public in the shell company, the SPAC. That raises capital to purchase, to acquire this other private company, public company, whatever. Now, because it's a shell company, it doesn't have any revenue. It doesn't have any earnings. So the lack of disclosure. So how do we know how much these things are worth? How does an underwriter value the shares? So that's why they fix it. They fix the share or unit price of SPACs at $10 per unit. That is a fixed price for SPACs. For those of us from Series 7, you know, we often talk about uh, how we value IPOs, right? Mm -hmm. Supply and demand, earnings, financials, fundamentals, all sorts of things. But we don't have that with SPACs. So the regulators have said, eh, 10 bucks sounds good. Yeah, I, I, first time I've ever heard it was from your debrief. And uh, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah, somebody had said, you know, how much um, are SPACs offered at? I go, and I thought the same thing you did, uh, based on earnings. Based, mm -hmm. I go, wait a minute, they don't have earnings. I don't know. <laughs> so I had to go do some research to actually find the answer to You this. know, you've got questions like this. I don't know if uh, we're... Uh, we're about 17 minutes in, and if you're watching our, our podcast series, uh, I love little things like this, these uh, nuggets, these uh, golden nuggets in our in our podcast, because I'll tell you what, when I take a test, Brian, I always like to get to the first question I know I know the right answer to. That's right. You know, hopefully I'm not like 15 deep. Uh, I'm wishing for our 66 test takers, question number one, what is the IPO <laughs> price of a SPAC? <laughs> Woo! $10. <laughs> You know, I kind of think this is what makes my premium vodka taste so good. <laughs> there you go. There you go. <laughs> it's from the hard work of all of us. Over That's exactly years. right. <laughs> One other thing before we uh, move on from SPACs. Oh, sure. You even started talking about these sponsors. Yes. Under uh, I believe technically in the industry, they're referred to as finders. Well, they can be because they're going to go find the acquisition. So Exactly. You know, and sometimes they come with management teams in place. I've had some uh, some experience in doing a very similar kind of transactions, reverse mergers into public shells. And so, oh, yeah. yeah, and you, sometimes you start with a team and then you go find them a business or they build a business. So, yeah, it, indeed, indeed. And yeah, then the so finder typically is getting a percentage of the share. So, you know, to uh, me, the vast I, majority. I, 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 that's right. To me, to, this whole thing seems so esoteric that, you know, what's it doing on a test for crying out loud? Well, they were, you know, celebrities promoting their own versions of SPACs where they were going to go, you know, do whatever they're going to do. Uh, Virgin uh, Space. Okay. Yeah, okay. Add one. I'll I put mean, 20 anyway. bucks on the table that this thing ain't going to be on this test a year. Well, from we'll now. see. We'll see. Yeah. I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah. It's like we talked about digital assets. Maybe we'll talk about that as well. I think it, the, the, they're always behind the curve in trying right. to protect investors. It's, exactly. it's, you know, it's regulation or protection that comes after the fact, not be right. typically before right. the fact. After the horse has already left the barn. Exactly right. 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 Yeah. 33 and 34. Uh, about that's what happened I was prior thinking that. <laughs> That's exactly right. After the crash of 29, <laughs> yeah, right. two laws in 33 and 34. Insider right. Trading Act of 88. You might think we yeah, have problems exactly. in 87. You'd be right. You know, so. In fact, sometimes when I'm at conferences with regulators and they're introducing a rule, I'll say, what's the story behind that one? Yes. I think, well, yes. what do you mean? I said, there's got to be a story. I mean, there's always a story behind whatever kicks off that that regulatory, you know, initiative of whatever That's it is. Right. That's right. Uh, investment companies, open end versus closed end. Again, probably not too different from some Series 7 stuff. Yeah. But it's it's it, it happens to be a little bit more pointed on the 65, 66 exams. The differences between the open end and the closed end. 
um, open end, of course, priced once a day at 4 p.m. Uh, based on the value of the securities inside the portfolio. So it's only valued once a day. And then they start getting into the share class, class A, class B, class C. Why do they still ask questions about class B shares? They haven't been able to be sold since 2010. <laughs> I got to tell you, it doesn't allow their sales, but they're still on the test. Remember, uh, class I, it's the same with Coverdale's. I know I don't know of any financial institution anymore that doesn't that cover offer, even offers Coverdale's because the 529s, I tell people on the test, you will say the 529 is always the better recommendation. That's right. I mean, you know, uh, so. Again, I think it's easier to add things than to take away things. That's exactly so, right. So, you know, uh, nobody hits the delete key. Even test prep vendors, I have to say, will never call their, their banks for questions that nobody has seen for years. And I think NASA, FINRA, no different. They, they don't typically take things away, even if they know they're inappropriate. It's anti or, antiquated, yeah. Yeah, even if they know we, most people are never going to be doing business and those things. By the way, I usually say the reason they don't allow it anymore is because they were so confusing that even the brokers who sell them couldn't figure them out, right? So I tell a little different story, but it doesn't matter. Yeah. It really doesn't. Uh, uh, the contingent deferred sales charge. I, I do, you know what? I, I still add the suitability factors to the diff different class uh, share classes. Yeah, yeah. That's well, some, A is long-term, large investors. Large amount, break right. points. B, right. B is smaller, smaller amount. Investors, longer yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. That's right. That's uh, right. Do you add, Brian, I usually add uh, the, the you can't miss that what they're concerned with as well as misuse of no load terminology that I don't get into that sales. too much. Okay. No, but anyways, no. a contingent deferred sales charge is still a sales charge though. So. Or, right. you know, I always joke, you know, you know, I shouldn't mislead people and say, Hey, Brian, you don't pay me. The fund pays me. No, you know, yeah. it's like using a travel agent. No, that's a, that's a, a bad analogy. Right. So that's exactly uh, right. open end and closed end. Same thing. Supply and demand. Yep. versus uh, trades uh, on the market NAV uh, plus sales charge right and 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 you know the closed end still does calculate the NAV each yep. day yeah but the market price is independent it's of that it's the only fund that could be trading at less than the NAV right the trades at a discount that's right yeah. Good. that's exactly Good. right yeah. yeah so that's Future's an option you know about closed ends uh, i think that you know here's i think and Brian maybe we both agree on this this is very uh, familiar, but be careful of those familiar things like open and closing. What I mean by that is I think there's there's no different question on 66 about open versus closed. It's there for sure. Yeah. Uh, then there is seven. Hopefully for you, that's the case. That's right. uh, but beware. Beware. Yeah. Futures and options. Uh, options, you might get two. One of them's got to be a hedge. And it's ain't no different than what you've seen on the seven. It's never an issue. Um, I, I'm not going to say ignore it, but again, I don't know how much I trust the, the textbooks mm -hmm. and how far they go with it. There's just not a lot of option questions anymore. I agree with you. The, the, the one thing you got to watch out for are the futures because that's yep. not on the series seven. Right. Right. Uh, commodities. And and one thing also for the Series 66, it might be more of a law and regs question, is that futures and forward contracts are not securities. They're derivatives, but they're not securities. You don't have to. Yeah, I, I think it's pretty agents. basic. If you just think of a future, uh, I just think of a future as being even simpler than options. So you're either going long or short. If That's you it. think the price of the, of the underlying is going up, you go long the futures. If you think it's going down, you go short the futures. And then again, it would be no different than, again, whether you're speculating or you're hedging, it's still going to be that price on the futures. And the other thing is that uh, the contracts and the futures and the forwards are better than, you know, a negotiated contract that you and I might have. That, you know, That's that right. They yeah. uh, you know, there's one thing I depart with uh, the Tex-Mex. Well, actually, there's more than one yeah. thing that I depart with with the textbooks. But uh, when it comes to forward contracts, I, I call it a, a, for anyone who has seen my Series 66 video uh, in Aura 65 uh, or taken my live class years ago. Yeah. I tell people this is the Farmer Brown question. Yeah. Farmer Brown ain't going to be buying forward contracts. It's not really spelled out that way in the textbooks. I tell people that forward contracts, because they're not standardized, they're just whatever two people negotiate. That right. John and Jane Q. Public are not sophisticated enough to be playing with forward contracts. 
So if you see a farmer brown concerned with his wheat crop, you sell wheat futures. Don't yeah, get I, involved in forward contracts. Well, I always, the way I can say it, I'll, I'll, it sounds like we're saying the same thing. I always say when I teach series three and, you know, sometimes it's at places like Cargill, uh, you know, people, you know, I, I joke the people in the Midwest are as obsessed about the price of beans as we on the yeah. East Coast and West Coast are about the, the stock market. I always say you do in the futures market today what you're going to do in the cash market later on. That's called the spot market. So you're talking about Farber Brown. Right on, Brian, right? Farmer Brown is going to be selling soybeans. And so that's what he's going to do in the forwards market. He's afraid the price of beans. He's not afraid they're going up. No. <laughs> He's afraid they're going down. So he's going yeah. to do a substitute sale. He's going to buy the future, sell the future short, hoping right. that that future, if he's correct on the hedge, goes down. He'll make up a little bit on that That's futures right. contract. That he lost the cash mark. But That's I agree right. with you. Again, yeah. it's such a challenge, 66 test takers, to make decisions about how much time you want to go into these uh, areas. Not where right. There might be one or two points. And I think we shared them with you right here. And so do you want to spend, I don't know, 100 text pages and the test prep vendor? I'm not. I we don't just think did that best. with options on Series 7. We spent three months on that crap, right? <laughs> yeah. So, again, it's not really covered that much. Yeah. Uh, investment analysis. Here it is. This is my baby. Okay. Uh, I, 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 this stuff is different from the 7. It's far more uh, into this analysis when it comes to debt and or equity. Uh, the most important thing, of course, would be the discounted cash flow. We're trying to remember, right? Let's just pretend we're constructing this portfolio. And it's a 60-40. So we got 40% fixed income and cash equivalent. So we got to choose our bonds wisely. Which means I want to pay a fair price for the darn thing. And that's going to be determined by how much cash, how much income this bond's going to pay me over the life of the bond. Mm -hmm. That's what discounted cash flow does. Definition. It determines the fair market price for a bond based on future cash flow. That's it. Fair market price. You know another word for that? Present value. Okay? That's the basic definition. Yeah, I love it. I just did, did, did a tutoring session today, and that's exactly what we're talking about. We were talking about a bond that had a 6.5% coupon. That's there should be a review, hopefully. That's $65 in annual interest, right. two payments of $32.50, right. 10 year bond. That means we're getting 20 payments of $32.50. What That's is right. the present value of 20 payments of $32.50, realizing that money today is more value than money down the road, right? So right. the $32.50 six months from the day, and then your point at uh, present value. I always uh, add to that, Brian, we're not going to have to calculate it right please no we might get a present value comparison to a price all right and you call that present value and the difference might be what we call net means different net present value that's right uh one question i generally point people to uh is what are the constituents of an investment that determines the long-term cash flow it's the coupon rate also known as nominal, be careful with synonyms, and which is a, per, uh, a percentage of the par value, also known as the principal, be careful with synonyms, and the maturity, which determines, just like Dean just said, the number of payments you're going to get. Those three things is what determines the cash flow in the future. Now, if you're given that choice, and there's four answer sets, each have three uh, constituents, one of those answer choice will say market price, coupon rate. No, market price isn't a part of the cash flow. That's what we're trying to calculate is that market price. That's the X in the formula. So any answer choice you see in that set that says market price, you're going to eliminate it immediately. That doesn't determine income. It determines yeah. yield, but not income. Right? Love it. I love it. Uh, I also just would add to that. This is associated with investments that have income streams. So when applied to common stocks, we call it the dividend discount model. Right. Right. If I'm going to get uh, Bank of America quarterly dividend of 21 cents, I get X number of dividends, you know, same thing. And then if we assume the dividend is going to rise, 
18 cents was what Bank of America's former dividend was. Now it's 21. Uh, I think it may be 24. That would be called the dividend growth model, and that would justify a higher valuation. That's now, right. Now, we're not going to have to do the math again, but if we get the present value, right, and we can buy it today at more or less, then that would be something we'd be interested in. What do you think uh, about two things, Brian? I'll ask you because I know besides being a test geek, you're a math geek. Uh, what do you think about this concept, two things, of net present value and internal rate of return is, it, uh, uh, is associated with discounted cash flow? Uh, we, I, 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 I try to cover it separately because it's okay. really its own separate. Okay. And I believe we covered it with uh, episode one really? okay, of the business information. Um, so I, it is uh, a discounted cash flow valuation, but I try to c- cover it separately. Okay. Again, because I'm just worried about the test. Definitions yeah. of IRR and net present value. And the o- only reason I bring it up is because I usually touch on it. If we, we don't have net present value, then that number is the internal rate of return. That's right. That's exactly so, right. Uh, the one thing uh, I'm going to disagree with you just okay. a tad. Yeah. You might have to calculate the dividend discount model. Really? Annual rate. I'm sorry. Annual income divided by rate is what gives you the present value. There's oh. a couple of tricky, sneaky. Oh, I, yeah. Okay. Well, that's ways they can ask. That's like your ten dollar thing. That's new to me as well. <laughs> uh, they might just ask for the formula and not ask you to actually. Well, what I've heard, what I've heard is, in terms of debrief on dis- dividend discount model, is in what situation uh, can you not apply the dividend discount model? I think the obvious thing, remember, would be a stock with no dividend. That's right. Uh, another question is, where can you not apply the dividend growth model? You know, the test is always negative. You can't do it in a preferred stock because the assumption is the dividend is. And then the, your point, a, a very strong agreement on this point about the math and the inputs more than can you do the math. But the idea of what does the math uh, end up being? What I mean by that is the end result. And the other thing that I hear sometimes on debrief is that the dividend growth model would result, no surprise, in a higher valuation. I'd be willing to pay a higher price Right. Or a stock with the assumption that my dividend is going to grow than a stock in which I don't have that assumption. That's right. Uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of my infamous grandma in perpetuity question. <laughs> no, no, I have not. Um, it's It's been around the concept. Let's, uh-huh. I'm going to dance around this a little bit. Right, right. Um, grandma wants to pay her seven grandkids a thousand bucks a month. Oh, I think I saw one of your practice questions. That's exactly right. Um, So how much would she invest if we assume a 3% return? Yeah. So that's a thousand a month. That's 12,000 a year divided by the rate of 3%. That's a dividend discount. Oh, there you go. I always wonder. And they don't mention any of that about dividend discount, but that's exactly what it is. I could also tell you that the dividend discount model calculation is just an inverse of the current yield formula. Wow. That's why I said, not only is he the test geek, he's the I pre- My vodka's tasting better every day, pal. I was wondering why you had that grandma question in there. Your, uh, I love it. I love the grandma <laughs> in perpetuity question. Yeah. 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 All right. On to technical and fundamental analysis. I, You know, I, I, again, I, I don't find this to be as much of a problem on the 66 as the I don't 65. Either. Yeah. Because the Series 66 just took the Series 7, they're a little bit more in tune with equity, securities, and those sorts of things, where Series 65 is a larger population of right. non finance people. But anyway, uh, technical versus fundamental, obviously finances. So I always tell people to connect F for fundamental, F for finances. Duh. <laughs> But, you know, they can get a little esoteric with that as well. You know, it's P.E., it's earnings per share. Anything that has a financial ratio to it is fundamental analysis. Technical stock charts. And, you know, in Series 7, right, heads and shoulders, uh, resistance and support, price and volume history, that's all technical analysis. And that's really the difference. The only question you might see is all our fundamental accept something yeah. like that. I don't what, think it's what is used in both of those schools. That's right. right that's exactly right. Well, listen, insurance products. Ugh. <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, I come from the security side of the business, Brian, and I always joke that stockbrokers sell greed and insurance agents sell fear. Stockbrokers say, wouldn't life be wonderful if... 
And yes. an insurance agent say, oh, wouldn't life be terrible if? Now, if you happen to be duly registered, then you can sell both fear and greed. <laughs> but uh, you have a good question <laughs> on your practice exam on equity indexed annuities. Uh, key point, you cannot lose your principal in an equity indexed annuity. And that's why it's an insurance product and not a securities product. This isn't like uh, other, like a variable annuity where there's a mutual fund. And then I think, Brian, you have a good question that I get a lot of a debrief that people see about how we do that reset on the equity indexed annuity. That's right. You want to speak to that uh, a little bit? So, yeah, uh, it's very interesting to me because, again, it's it's a concept for me that's just – because anytime you guarantee something, that just – you know, my yeah, brain just to be insurance. <laughs> exactly. That's insurance. I say, there's two nasty words we don't use in the securities industry, the word guarantee and the word approve. <laughs> that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So – and and I, I, also, I also tell people that people make a lot of money selling these things because how would you like to invest in the stock market – participate in its growth and never lose money. Woo. That's an equity. That's I know. Insurance. That's insurance. <laughs> but and that's why the product was designed though, Brian, right? So insurance. That's right. Agents, but there's no free lunch. Yeah. How do we pay for that guarantee? Well, you don't get all of the stock market's return. You only get to participate in a percentage of it. That's called the participation rate, like 80% right. of the market. Right. The insurance company keeps the other 20 percent to insure their butts when the market goes down. Right. And they also cap it. So if the market goes up, remember the late 90s, early 2000s, yeah. the dot com bubble when markets were going up 40 percent a year. Well, you're capped at 15. Sorry, pal. You're not yeah. getting any more than that. I, the, but, the thing I would add to that, Brian, is that the one I get a lot on debrief is to recognize there is no negative reset. That's right. So where they give you that sequence of returns and then yes. the market tanks, it goes down yes. 20 and they try and bait you into resetting that thing at, you know, a uh, negative number. No, no That's negative right. reset year no. to year. Right. No, no. The value never goes down. Right. And then life insurance uh, shouldn't be sold as an investment. And uh, I know you have uh, forgotten more about life insurance than I have ever known. So uh, could you speak to what do you I, I now call me out I, if you think I'm wrong. Two, three questions, maybe, Max? Uh, at least, yeah. Nope, I think they'll make a little bit more. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, since they've actually reduced the number of investment vehicle questions, that's probably, yeah, that's probably accurate. Now, I, I want to tell the story. Um, a gal who'd gone through my Series 7 class um, did extremely well. Back in the day when they used to give you your passing score, she scored mm -hmm. like an 84% on the Series 7. Oh. It was really good. Smart, smart, smart yeah. lady. And then she came in, took my Series 66 class, and then a week later, she goes, Brian, I got a 69. I know. And she goes, man, it was just those darn insurance. Now, she did – I'm sorry. She did not take my class. And uh, she called me up and said she got a 69. I said, take my class. And I go, all right, this one's for you. And I have a, a chart, a very simple chart in my class notes that depict the differences. And there's only really three, the whole life, the variable – and the universal variable life, UVL. Now, if you're insurance guy or gal, be careful because there's a lot of different types of universal in the real world. In the test world, there's not. There's only one. And it's only a separate account. That's it. So there's no guaranteed death benefits and no guaranteed cash value in a vari universal, variable universal, VUL, sorry. Yeah. Okay. And you're even allowed to skip premiums. But then wow. the assumption is they're going to deduct the cost of insurance out of the separate account. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Typically, from a suitability standpoint, it's usually for a little higher net worth yeah. uh, individual who does the VUL. Right. And that's really, bit, uh, really it. You have to as associate uh, the death benefit, whether it's guaranteed or not, and mm -hmm. the cash value, whether it's guaranteed or not with the different types of life insurance. And that's what that chart does. And it shows you the different buckets that the money goes into. It's a pretty simple, easy diagram to well, show we you. We could probably tell them that you, you can, uh, well, time for, for me to do a commercial for Brian. Uh, Brian has been very uh, kind in allowing access to some of his content on our YouTube channel, but uh, he does uh, have paid for supplements. And uh, I think the entire video series get it now we're coming to you in uh, the uh, end of november 
the last part of 2023. And I uh, think you're going to get some price increases uh, from the desk geek. So go act now. <laughs> uh, but what I was going to say is if you don't want to go all in on Brian's videos, which I think you should do as a supplement, and he uh, gives our viewers a 20% uh, discount, Guru20 yeah. is the discount code. Uh, he sells separately the PDFs he's referring to. And I highly recommend, I use them in a lot of tutoring sessions with people, whether it's that chart, you have another one where it's, you know, should they register, you know, what right. what do you call, it? It's called the cheat sheet, right? The cheat sheet. Yeah. You don't yeah. like that term, do you? I don't, I don't, I don't, because I'm afraid <laughs> someone's going to leave it at the exam site. And Oh, God, no, please. You know, so, but anyways. Uh, but Am I allowed I to love, take this into the test center? No. You know, <laughs> I do love the, the uh, thing. And I think that's like 40-something, Brian, just for the PDF. Uh, for the combination pack, yeah. And that comes with a practice final that is just spot on. So, yeah. you know, it's, it, it, I know some people starting out maybe don't have the resources, but if you do have the resource to invest, in a paid supplement, uh, I, I highly recommend hurt. Uh, Brian's products, particularly Thank the PDFs, you. if not all in. Yeah, go all I, in. Not, I appreciate that. Uh, uh, yeah. But again, for you, Series Seven, if you know if you don't have a lot of insurance background, uh, be careful with these: the indexed annuities, the life insurance. You know, that's there. definitely stuff you haven't gotten on the seven. And, and will be on the test. No, I it's can't imagine any. I call it the dream draw versus the face of death draw. Yeah. And I can't imagine any draw. You know, usually when we talk about draws, it's probability. And right. I can't think of uh, any uh, less than 100% probability. I'm joking. But high probability, you're going to see equity indexed annuity. People yeah. tell us they see things. We're not surprised. Every once in a while, I told you, Brian, uh, mm -hmm. I feel like he gets these weird ones that end up being there before I do. But like that $10 thing, I've never heard of that before. <laughs> right. yeah. no. yeah. But uh, we're prepared for those, hopefully. And uh you know, make sure you you're, you get all those uh, layups that you're entitled to and those kind of right. questions that everybody knows is there. That's exactly all right. right. Last thing we got, Brian, for tonight's episode or today's episode, wherever you're watching this, uh, is other assets, which is commodities, precious metals, and digital assets. What is a precious metal? Not copper, stupid, but testable. <laughs> Platinum. Yeah. Platinum, gold, and silver there are you precious go. metals. Nothing. Copper and zinc are not. Yeah. yeah. And then why would you buy commodities? Remember, as an inflation hedge, that's certainly there. Right. Um, uh, what about digital assets? We have an episode. I think we covered uh, registration. I think digital assets are showing up as this idea is, does a digital asset, uh, is it a security or not? And let's assume that for test purposes, it is. Well, then that means it needs to be registered. And the people who are selling it need to be registered. The exchange on which it's being sold needs to be registered. It's right now the NASA and SEC against, you know, Coinbase and Binance and FTX. That's the intent, I think, on the test. I see a lot of people making videos on what they think are the digital asset questions. And I really think it's digital assets as securities that are where these questions are coming from. Can I tell you what I think? What do you think? I haven't a clue. There you go. My vodka does not have any digital assets. I've not heard any digital assets. They could be there. I'm not denying that they could be. I have no clue. I've not yeah. heard a thing. Well, we'll continue to collect debrief. I did. I have heard uh, a couple times about a digital asset question, but they usually start those questions as experimental questions. That's right. Uh, before they show up, is uh, they test them for validity before they show up in gap. Wouldn't they have to have a question, something about the volatility of those damn things, right? I mean, those things are all over the place. Well, They're I think really it's kind of like the SPAC question. Why is this showing up? Because again, like SPACs, we had non-fungible tokens. We had. I understand that. I understand, but wouldn't they have a question pertaining to the volatility of those assets? Oh, I mean, yeah, I don't know. you know, you know, these Which firms are acting the as their own exchange. Party? Right. Wouldn't it be nice to be on the NASA cocktail party when they discuss the Q Bank? <laughs> yeah, wouldn't that be? I always joke, Brian. Let's remember that the NASA guys are attorneys; they're not really investment professionals. That's most right. of them. So that's exactly your right. your point. You know, would you think they'd have volatility? I I don't know. Would it be correct to say? Please help me here, yeah, right? Yeah. To refine my vodka a little better. Yeah. Uh, that the firms who trade these for customers are basically acting as their own exchange, right? There's no centralized exchange. No, there is not. 
and there is so not. each firm is kind of acting as their own. What exchange. if the firm would become important? Like if it's Fidelity, I would have no worries if they're, they're the ones providing this. Exactly, but it's not. It's, you know, yeah. digital assets are us. Maybe not. You know. <laughs> so I, I I haven't a clue. I don't know what uh, what any questions about digital assets are showing up on the test. I've well, you know, we do our live streams every Tuesday, uh, five p.m., and our very special guest for most of those Tuesdays is Brian. And whether Brian joins us or not, when we when we hear, uh, we will certainly uh, put out the uh, the broadcast. Uh, hey, yeah. people are reporting. That's what typically what uh, one of the things we do on our Tuesday nights. Uh, next episode, Brian is going to be client, customer, investment recommendations and strategies. Yeah, uh, thirty questions. I don't know. We'll probably talk about whether we break that up or how we're going to do that. We're trying to get these. Uh, uh, well, I, I guess we shouldn't. You know, probably. I know this is video, but. Uh, we're trying. This is a new series. We did a 65 series working on this one. We're trying to get, keep a pace about once a week. So if you're joining us on a current basis, uh, be looking next week for episode three. Uh, any closing comments, Brian, before I. Uh... Uh, for investment vehicles, again, you know, be careful. It's the area that people kind of miss the grade on. Yeah. Believe it or not, it's just hard for me to fathom someone passing a series seven. Right is failing yeah. the investment vehicle yeah, section you, on the series 66. But you it's don't because want of be these that. things. It's these, these things that are not yeah. showing up on the seven. Yeah, like the don't, uh, life insurance and all this. Yeah, you certainly, stuff. Like I say, three and oh is so much better than two and one. You just don't yes, want to be yes. in that position. So exactly. All right. Well, remember, uh, inch by inch, your 66 is a cinch. Yard by yard, your 66 is hard. And then I'm thinking about changing, getting your kicks on the series 66. There you go. <laughs> Brian. Keep it simple. Stay with what you know. You take the test. Don't let the test take you. All right, everybody. Thanks, we everybody. You, uh, Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.